Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here today. Uh, for those of you I've not met yet, my name is Nathan Saunders. Uh, my wife, Ruth Ann, and I, and our children, Lillian and Abraham, have been here for a couple of years now. And so I appreciate Daniel inviting me this morning to come and open the Word on this one Sunday of the year when everyone's lost an hour of sleep. It's very <laughs> nice to be here. Um, that just means spring is around the corner. That's a good thing. The days are getting longer. The nights are getting warmer. Summer's on its way. Brit's Donuts opens up March 31st. God is good. Yes and amen. We are looking forward to that. It is one of the most famous lines in all of film history. Luke Skywalker, dangling to a pole, holding on for dear life, looks at Darth Vader and he says, I know you killed my father. And Darth Vader says, no, I am your father. And if I just spoiled that for you, I'm very sorry. <laughs> In the pre-internet days, I don't know what audiences were expecting when they went in. I would love to have heard the, heard the gasp, the shock when they first heard that line. But in real life, the search for our fathers and mothers, the search for our ancestors, our great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, has become a major hobby. Uh, genealogy is a big deal. It's something that a lot of people engage in for a lot of time. Some people, it's an obsession. Um, there's a, there are TV shows like Who Do You Think You Are? where we follow celebrities around looking for their ancestors. It is a multi billion dollar industry. Uh, Ancestry.com literally has hundreds of millions of subscribers, and three years ago it sold to Blackstone for $4.7 billion. It's a huge hobby. But for some people, it's even more than a hobby. It's a quest for identity. There are some people who are adopted and who use these services to try to find their birth parents. There are some people who have uncovered uh, long-lost siblings some people take the Ancestry DNA test, and they find out they are not, in fact, who they thought they were. <laughs> and so today, we're going to be in John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. And we're going to meet some people with whom Jesus is debating. And this group of people thinks that their ancestry is not just something to be studied. It's not just something that defines their identity. But their ancestry, in fact, defines their righteousness. And Jesus tells them that their ancestry does not define their righteousness. What defines their righteousness is, first of all, their acknowledgement that he is God the Son, the Son of God, the Messiah to whom they were looking, who came to save them, to give them eternal life. And unless... They take that step and accept that. Unless they recognize him as such, they can never hope for salvation. They are not, in fact, who they thought they were. The truth himself has come to tell them who he is. The truth himself stands before them in this passage, but they don't recognize it. So how does Jesus reveal himself to his hearers? How does he make it plain to them uh, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God? How does he make it plain to him them uh, that he is the one for whom they have been looking? There are three sort of movements in this passage from verse 31 through 59 in this debate. This is actually the culmination of a debate that's been going on all the way since chapter 5. Through various trips in Jerusalem, uh, Jesus has taken the opportunity to explain who he is to those who are listening. In this case... He's going to take three steps. In the first part, he's going to say, I came to give you freedom, freedom from sin. And their response is, we're already righteous. Then he's going to explain to them, they don't know the Father. And he's come to show them the Father. And their response is, we already know the Father. And in the third step, he's going to fully reveal who he is. And they're going to say, we don't need you. They're not righteous but they think they are. They don't know the Father, but they think they do. And they need Jesus, but they don't realize it. So let's start in verse 31 and read a few verses and see, first of all, how Jesus explains their condition to them, how he reveals himself and how he explains to them who they really are. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, 
If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. As I mentioned a second ago, every new trip to Jerusalem for a festival brought an opportunity for Jesus to explain who he was. And this is the case here with the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the feasts where the Jews looked back on the Exodus and remembered God's goodness to them in the wilderness as they left Egypt and journeyed towards the Promised Land. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles because it was during that time they lived in tents or tabernacles, and God provided for them in the wilderness. There are many aspects of this festival, but Jesus all along has taken the time that week to show them that these pieces, these rituals, these ceremonies point to him. And so when the priest would go down to the pool of Siloam and draw water and then go back up to the altar and pour it, he took the opportunity to say, look, if you thirst, come to me. Streams of living water will flow out of you. When the priest would light the lamps at night in the courtyard to commemorate God leading them out of Egypt with a pillar of fire by night, he looked at that and he said, look, I'm the light of the world. In fact, I'm the light that was leading you out of Egypt, whether you recognize it or not. And so this is the setting in which Jesus engages in this dispute. Now, it's very interesting that John says that these Jews believed in Jesus. Uh, by the end of this, we'll see that they do not ultimately believe in Jesus. John does not include the parable of the sower in his gospel. But we kind of see it illustrated over and over again in John's gospel, where the sower sows the seed, and the seed falls on good soil and rocky soil. We see many times in John's gospel where people are following Jesus for a time, but ultimately they fall away. They were not true disciples at all. So Jesus here said to them, if you abide in me, you will have life. The truth will set you free. And they completely bypassed that. Um, instead of saying this beloved verse, which to many of us is a familiar verse, a beloved verse, we, we, um, we remember it. Uh, they get angry at it and just blow right past it and then focus on the fact as they say, that they have never been slaves. Now, this is a preposterous claim, considering why they are, in fact, in Jerusalem at this moment, which is to commemorate God leading them out of Egypt from slavery. It would be like coming to an Easter service and saying, empty tomb, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. What are you talking about? Well, why are we even here? That's the point that, of the festival. That's why they have shown up in Jerusalem at this time. But Jesus continues to press this point, and he gives this illustration that slaves at that time in the Roman world were not permanent members of the household. Children were permanent members of the household. Slaves, however, could be bought and sold, as slavery has been throughout human history. And he's pressing the point that you think that you're children of Abraham. You think you're children of the household. I've come to set you free because you are, in fact, slaves. Notice that Jesus does not just lay out everything all at once. He doesn't just, there is a time for that, and Jesus does that at various points in the Gospels. But in this case, he's sort of dangling some bait. He's sort of leaving some breadcrumbs so that they follow the truth or the truth he wants to give them, whether they believe it or not. And so he says, I know you're children of Abraham. It's sort of a concession. But then he gives these sort of tantalizing statements. Well, I do what my father does, and you do what your father does. Now, the, obviously, the next question is, well, who is your father? Our father is Abraham. And so Jesus has been leading them into this truth, this truth that descent from Abraham does not necessarily mean that you're of the household of faith. That being a child of Abraham has something to do other than, with something other than physical descent. Um, back in 1999, Ruth Ann and I were summer resort missionaries in Curie Beach, North Carolina. It was a hardship posting, as you can imagine. It was really tough. Papua New Guinea, South Sudan, Pleasure Island. Uh, that's where we were. But we used to go around and talk to many people about the gospel and share the gospel uh, with whomever we could. And one of the tactics that people sometimes use to get us to leave them alone was to say, well, you know, I, I, my parents are very active in their church. Or 
my grandfather was a pastor or my, my cousin's a missionary, and people talk about their faith or their relationship to Christianity, I said, should say, like ethnicity, like I'm, I'm a quarter Irish or I'm, a, I'm an eighth Italian or, you know, I'm, I'm a fourth Catholic, I'm an eighth Lutheran, there's some Pentecostalism on my mother's side, and that's how it would be presented uh, to us to say, look, you know, back off, I'm good, uh, I have these external markers of righteousness, and you don't need to share the gospel with me. Uh, one of the sad truths of church history that we see over and over again is that there are many, many heroes of the faith whose children uh, don't end up following the Lord. Uh, Bishop J.C. Ryle is, a, is something of a hero of the faith in England, uh, fought hard to defend the truth of the gospel in the Church of England, but had four sons, all of whom rejected the truth of the Bible, and one of whom became very prominent in the Church of England, but did so while a complete skeptic on the truth of this word right here. Um, Aaron Burr, many of you who are familiar with him as the man who murdered Alexander Hamilton, uh, also had an affair with a married woman, also supposedly, allegedly attempted to create his own country in the western part of the United States and was brought up on treason charges. So not a good character to emulate. However, he was the grandson of none other than Jonathan Edwards. Um, we see this over again even in the Bible. And Samuel, Eli, Samuel, David, they, they all have children who do not follow in the footsteps of righteousness. There is no such thing as a righteousness gene. There's nothing that you can inherit that makes you righteous before God. And we may not think of ourselves in that way, think, oh, you know, I, I, I'm righteous because my parents give a lot of money to the church, et cetera. But we all look for these external markers that say, hey, I'm, I'm good. You don't have to share the gospel with me. Leave me alone. Or, or I'm, I'm, I'm set. Don't, uh, don't bring that truth to me because I have these markers of righteousness. The phrase virtue signaling means that I'm going to put my righteousness on display so that other people can affirm it for me, so that other people can see that I am righteous. And that's ultimately crushing because not only do we have to convince ourselves we're righteous, we have to convince everybody else that we're righteous as well. Um, it's exhausting, but all legalism is exhausting. All legalism is ultimately uh, the root of pride, the root of bitterness, the root of insecurity, the root of conflict. Whether it's Galatia in the first century or it's in Amer America in 2023, anytime we pick up on these external markers and say that these are what make us righteous, whether it's dissent, whether it's circumcision, whether it's a bumper sticker we put on a car, a meme we share on social media, any of these things that try to say to others, look, we're, I'm in the right camp. I'm in the right group. If we're honest with each other, however, and we really think about our sin, it becomes evident that we have no grounds for thinking that we are free apart from the righteousness of Christ. He came to set us free, yet sin so easily and deeply entangles us. One lie leads to another. One glance at a neighbor's test in a classroom leads to another. One bitter thought about a coworker. One prideful thought. Um, one angry thought at a spouse. One doubt about the goodness of God leads to another and another and another and another. And before we know it, we are completely ensnared. And so how absurd it is to think that these external um, ideas, or these external identifications can somehow fix what is so deeply rooted in our hearts, and what has so deeply entangled us in the very depths of our soul. I have an Atlanta Braves hat, but I have yet to receive my World Series ring from 2021 in the mail. I don't know. It got lost. <laughs> but having that hat does not endow me with the power to be a championship athlete. Identifying with that team does not mean that I have the skill level or even the, um, even the opportunity to participate with that team as they won a championship a couple of years ago. It's foolishness to think that because our parents were church-going people or because our name is on a church roll somewhere, maybe we haven't even been to that church in decades, that for some reason those things are calls for our hope. But Jesus here has said we do have a cause for hope, and it's him. He has come to set us free. We are to abide in his word, and then we are truly his disciples. The truth will set us free. And how do we abide in that truth. We read the truth. We pray the truth. We sing the truth every morning here. We encourage each other in the truth. We correct and challenge each other in the truth when we stray. We 
share the truth to lift each other up, to remind each other of the great God that we serve and the great salvation that he has wrought for us with his death and resurrection. Those truths are what dwell in us and that in which we should abide. And speaking of truth, in part two, beginning over here in verse 39, Jesus walks them through some more. They took the bait in verse 39. They answered him and they said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And maybe that was a bit of a swipe at rumors about Jesus' own birth. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you will do, your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. You see, Jesus knows what is in their hearts. He knows the hearts of all people. And he knows that they have murderous intent that will soon overflow into murderous action. Jesus here repeats a charge he had made in John chapter 7 in which he says, you're trying to, you're trying to kill me and I know it. And John himself told us way back in chapter 5 that uh, they wanted to kill Jesus because he called God his father and made himself equal with God. It is moving slowly through John's gospel to the last week of Jesus' life, on which John spends most of his time on the death and resurrection of Christ. Jesus obviously knows what is ahead of him. But why do they want to kill Jesus? It's because they hate the truth. But why then does hating the truth translate into wanting to kill Jesus? I'll ask a different question that has the same answer. When John the Baptist was baptizing and the Pharisees were coming out to see him. He looked at them and he said, you brood of vipers, who told you to come and repent? Now, why brood of vipers? Obviously, snakes are distasteful. Uh, they're scary. I would have said nest of rats. I'd rather have a snake than a rat any day. But he says, you brood of vipers. You see, John the Baptist and the Pharisees both knew what God had promised to Adam and Eve back in Genesis 3, that there would be a seed of a woman who is going to crush the head of the serpent, although the serpent would bruise his heel. And what John the Baptist was saying to those Pharisees essentially was, you think you were the seed of the woman? You are in fact the seed of the serpent. And Jesus here says the same thing. You think you're children of Abraham? You are in fact children of the devil. And notice that even though he says three times, you know, I tell you the truth and you don't believe me, it's not because they are unaware, it's not because they are ignorant, it's not because they are uh, unlearned. Verse 43 says, you do not understand, why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. This is a visceral, emotional reaction to the truth standing before them. This is a cosmic struggle that is now taking place between good and evil. And obviously, we know that good overcomes the evil, that it's not really a struggle that is in doubt, but this is a cosmic confrontation between good and evil that we see here in verse 43. And they cannot bear to hear his word. Throughout history, we often encounter violent, sometimes shockingly, strangely violent reactions to the preaching of the grace of God. And it often doesn't make any sense. Why the violent reaction to what we see before us? In the second century, there was a bishop named Polycarp who refused to burn incense to the emperor. That was it. He preached the gospel. He said, I'm not going to burn incense to the emperor. I'm not here to overthrow the emperor. I'm just not going to burn incense. They burned him at the stake and ran him through with a spear. He was 86 years old. Was he really a threat to the Roman Empire? John Huss, about a century before the Reformation, preaching the gospel of grace, had wood piled up to his neck while he was tied to a stake. 
then is set on fire, then had his ashes scattered in the Rhine River so that no one could go visit his grave. Really? Was that necessary? Was he that much of a threat preaching the gospel of grace? Many of you are familiar also with the Voice of Martyrs ministry and the work, historically speaking, of, of Richard Wurmbrand, who was in Romania uh, under communism in the 20th century. Was it necessary to take him and to beat the bottoms of his feet until his bones show through, burn him with hot pokers and throw him in a hot freezer? Oh, excuse me, not hot freezer, a cold freezer, a walk-in freezer? Was that really necessary? Over and over and over again, we see these Instances, And we have brothers and sisters in Christ around the world today who have already worshipped, people in Afghanistan and Iran and North Korea, who have already had their Sunday worship, but they could not come to a place like this and sing and listen to the word and fellowship. It had to be in secretly, quietly. Are these responses to the gospel really necessary, or is there something else going on here? Is there something cosmic going on here? Is there something else deeper than just simply, I don't like the message that you're saying, and I'm going to disagree with it intellectually. No, it goes much, much deeper than that. Many of you uh, are reading Let the Nations Be Glad and $5 Discipleship, and there's, there's a story in Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper, and she talks about a young man from Kenya who was walking along the road and heard the gospel and decided that this was such good news, he had to tell his friends and family in his village, he had to go tell them about the great things that God had done for them. When he went, he was met with gross hostility. He was beaten. They thought he was dead. They dragged him outside. And his thoughts to himself were, I must have done it wrong. I must have left something out. I must have misstated the gospel somehow. So he went back in and tried again and and received the same treatment. Again, they thought he was dead. He was not, in fact, dead. He thought the same thing. I must have left something out. I must have gotten something wrong. Why, Why this response to this good news? So he went back a third time, and this time was held down and beaten with barbed wire. Uh, and he thought, what, you know, I, why? Fortunately, he woke up a couple of days later, and the people who had been beating him were now washing his wounds with tears in their eyes as they, thought, they had thought about the message that he had preached. They had responded to that gospel. But many of us in America are tempted to think like that young man thought, uh, that people don't come to church, people don't come to Christ because there is something that we need to do differently when it comes to how we do church. It's foolish when we think of this cosmic struggle to think, well, people don't come to church because we sing old songs. People don't come to church because the preacher preaches too long. People don't come to church because they think we're weird. We go down to the beach in our Sunday clothes and we push each other under the waves and, you know, (laughs) What is going on here? They use big words. Why do people not come to church? And they focus on those things. They say, well, well, this must be why people aren't coming to church. If we can just prove that we're not weird, people will come to church. And so over the last 80 years, the church in America has uh, over and over again pulled out gimmick after gimmick after gimmick. Let's do a sermon series on the latest movie or television series that's hot right now. Let's give away a car at a youth group event. Let's... Um, These are real examples. I'm not making them up. Um, Instead of encouraging each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, another real example, let's play Highway to Hell by ACDC on Sunday morning. Real example. Let's do all of these things to prove to people that we're not strange, as if the people who who don't come to church don't come because we sing old songs off-key. Not this church. Y'all are great. Y'all don't sing off-key. But those are things that make people, we, we, we convince ourselves that if we could just fix this, that people will respond to the gospel. And the fact of the matter is people don't respond to the gospel because they hate the truth. They hate the truth. But we have no cause for boasting because we were, as Paul says in Colossians, rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Just like we're slaves and we can't free himself, we are prisoners in this domain of darkness. We have to be taken out and transferred. Notice Paul does not say that we defected to the kingdom of his beloved son. It's not as if we were in Cuba building a makeshift boat trying to get to Florida. We were not trying to find a way over the Berlin Wall, we had to be rescued. And so what we have to offer, thankfully, is the very thing that actually does have the power to disentangle the sin, to cut away the sin that has enslaved our hearts, and that is the preaching of the truth. And the great thing is, is that this works 
whether we come to a place like this and we have great lights and we have great musicians and we have great church foyer coffee and we have comfortable seats to sit in, and it also works if we have to come and sit on the floor in the dark and sing a cappella. Praise God that that is the means, as simple and yet as powerful as it is. And so why would we ever focus on these other externals? And so I praise God that we, we attend a church, we're members of a church where the truth is upheld every single Sunday. And so the temperature is really ratcheting up, not just right here in this pulpit with the air conditioning off, but it's really ratcheting up <laughs> here in this debate. And all pretense of politeness goes out the window in this last section. And the Jews answer Jesus. They've already said they're, they're righteous. They've already said they know the Father. So the Jews answer Jesus, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? If you were ever in a debate with somebody and they say, ah, see, you're demon-possessed, it has gotten real, and you just, <laughs> all pretense aside, just go for it. I'm just, just lay it out. No, no room for nuance anymore. Jesus answered and said, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. You have not known him. I know him. If I were to say I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and yet you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus here lays out a number of surprising, shocking claims. He preexisted his own physical birth. God the Son has always been. He did not come into being in the manger. He took on flesh, but he has always been. On top of that, Abraham was looking forward to that day when the Messiah, God the Son, would come. In Galatians, there's a really interesting argument in Galatians chapter 3 where Paul says um, Abraham was not looking for offsprings in terms of plural offspring. He was looking for one offspring. Abraham was looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And so Jesus here says, I preexisted my own birth, and on top of that, Abraham was looking forward to my coming. And then if that's not enough, he says, the Father seeks my glory. The Father glorifies me. If I were to ever, any man were to ever come into this pulpit and say, the Father is here to glorify me, you would rightly remove me from this pulpit. But Jesus has the right to say this because he is God. The thing, however, that sends them over the cliff, the thing that completely pushes them to carry out the murderous thoughts that are in their heart is when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is not just saying, I pre-existed my physical birth. He's not just saying, Abraham, look for me. He's saying, I am the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. I'm the one who said, look, if they ask who sent you, tell them, I am sent you. And that's who Jesus is claiming to be at this moment. They understand this, which is why they want to kill him right there. Throughout history, we've seen scholars, especially over the past two or three hundred years, embark on these quests for the historical Jesus. It's like this fever that sometimes they get where they just are like, we got to find who Jesus really was. And they start off from the premise that we can't trust this book. So we have to get rid of all the accruals of the centuries and get back down, historically speaking, to who Jesus really was. So some say he was a philosopher of ethics. Some say he was some sort of Jewish mystic. Some say he was... Uh, just a great teacher. Some say he was a Greek sage. Some say he was a revolutionary. Some say he was there as a magician, a wonder worker, an egomaniac. Basically, any answer will do for them other than that he is the God of the Bible, definitely not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
there was an Irish priest in the 20th century who said that these quests for the historical Jesus are really just one long succession of historians, one after the other, peering down the well of history and seeing a, their dim reflection looking back at them. Because as all of us, if we start from the point of saying, who is Jesus, rather than listening to him and, and listening to whom, who he says he is, we ultimately arrive at a Jesus who looks an awful lot like us and who says, hey, you're good as you were. Keep going. And we love the Gospel of John because we see in it Jesus washing his disciples' feet. We see in it Jesus weeping at the death of his friend Lazarus. And it's in the Gospel of John that we see Jesus calling us his friends. These are all wonderful things. But in the Gospel of John, we also see that Jesus is the Word who is with God and who was God. He is the light of the world. He's the resurrection. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the bread of life. He is all of these things. He is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father through whom all things were made. That's who Jesus is. If we worship Jesus as anything less than that, then we are not worshiping him as he's revealed himself to be in his word. And so the message at the beginning was to abide in that truth. And it was great that uh, during the song, John 15 was also up here, which also calls us to abide. That's kind of a strange command, though, isn't it? What do you want me to do, Jesus? I want you to stay put. I want you to right here. And those of, who, those of us who are parents, we get that sometimes it's a very difficult command to follow. How often do we say to our children, look, I just need you to stay right here. And then two seconds later, we look, and they are nowhere to be found. <laughs> My first and only time coaching soccer last fall. Um, <laughs> similar experience. Look, I need you to stay right here on this part of the field. Don't go anywhere else. It's almost like I should have said the opposite, and then they would have done it. But abiding is a very strange and interesting command. There's this wonderful unity in the message of the Bible. We are tempted to want to go after that mountaintop experience, that silver bullet, that one thing that will take us to our higher plane, that mission trip, the summer camp, this concert, this Bible study, anything that we think we can latch onto, and it's going to take us from here to here. When in fact, Jesus, Jesus just says, abide. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Speak to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. James says, to pray for each other, the work, the, the prayers of a righteous man avail much. These may sound very ordinary, but it's the daily, monthly, yearly, day after day, month after month, year after year, abiding in this truth that sets us free. We can chase after experiences, or we can simply listen to this message here that Jesus delivers, which is that his hearers are not righteous. They need a Savior who's going to die for them. They don't know God. They're separated from God because of their sins. They need to be brought back into relationship with God. And that he is the one to do it. Because he is God the Son, the Son of God. When Daniel preached through Romans, I want to thank Jim for reading Romans chapter 4 earlier. When Daniel preached through Romans, we get to chapter 9, and we find that not all Israel is Israel. We find that not all descendants of Abraham are really descendants of Abraham? Because it's by faith, by trusting Jesus, the same Jesus who speaks in this debate is the same Jesus whom we are to trust. We read in Romans chapter 6 that Jew and Gentile alike are enslaved to sin, and it's only by faith that they can be set free. Where do you think Paul learned that? He learned it from his Savior, as we learn it from our Savior. That freedom from sin doesn't come by our own effort. It comes by placing our trust fully and completely in the Messiah who died and rose again. And so this Easter season, meditate on that. Don't let the season pass you by without thinking of who Jesus is and what he came to do for you. Again, we're so prone to activity. We're so prone to want to say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? In John chapter 6, a man asked Jesus, what do we need to be doing to be doing the works of God? And Jesus' response Believe in the one that he has sent. 
believe in the one he has sent. And who has he sent? He sent his only son so that we could be justified, adopted, united to him for all eternity. Abide there. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we are completely and utterly hopeless without your grace. Father, the fact of the matter is we look to our own external markers, the own external uh, touchstones to justify us when in fact the problem is deep within our hearts. And it's only by your power that we can be made righteous. We praise you this Easter season that you did not remain aloof, but you came and saved us. You came to give us new life. Um, Father, I pray that the truth would never be far from our minds as we go about our week, um, as we live in this world, as we experience this cosmic struggle. Help us to remember the truth that sets men free. In Christ's name I pray, amen.